Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully this microphone's working and I've turned it on correctly. Welcome to this year's annual KCLEA lecture. I'd like to welcome both the attendees here in the auditorium as well as probably nearly 100 people from 20 countries online on Zoom with us tonight. I suspect they're from all different parts of the world and I hope nobody's up in the middle of the night or early hours of the morning to join us, but if they are, welcome. For anybody who's not familiar with KCLEA, let me perhaps just refresh your mind and memory on what the association is about. It's an association for engineers who have either studied or worked at King's. And KCLEA, KCLEA provides support to current students in the form of bursaries and uh, different grants and prizes and support to KCLES, the Student Society, ma uh, made up of current members of the different engineering groups and faculties here. I'd just like to, before we start tonight, to put something else in your diary, and that is to remind you that there will be an AGM and an annual lecture, oh, sorry, no, the, after, other than the annual lecture, the, the annual lecture is what we're here for tonight, an AGM and lunch on Saturday, November the 19th, and I do hope that many of you will be able to join us there. It's my pleasure tonight to be welcoming Mark in, Martin Stockley, who studied civil engineering here at King's, graduating in 1977. He has spent 50 years as a design practitioner in engineering in the build environment. Martin has worked on the design of major civil engineering and infrastructure on buildings, both new and historic, and on streets, parks, and public spaces. He has pursued a wide range of roles and has purposely not focused on one engineering specialization, rather aiming to understand the whole picture. He has gained an understanding of the impact of engineering infrastructure on the social, cultural, and economic behavior of people in cities, towns, and rural environments. Martin has developed an approach to the engineering of streets which challenges the traditional approach of highway engineers and which led to the publication of the UK's Department of Transport Manual for Streets Guidance. He has advised government, local authorities and a wide range of private clients, bringing a mix of technical, social, cultural and economic thinking. He has a wide range of experience and jobs including in recent years as Deputy Chair of the HS2 Design Review Panel and as a member and Vice Chair of Highways England's Design Review Panel at the Design Council. All of this makes Martin the ideal person to be presenting this year's KCLEA Annual Lecture on Human Sustainability, Designing Our Future. Martin, over thank, to you. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Uh, hello to the few people here who I know, or who know me, and I haven't recognised necessarily. And to all those that I don't know, good to meet you. Um, you probably guessed that a lot of this is about design, but, and it's quite a personal story, but it's also a King's story, I think. I'm going to begin with a confession which, in this place, I think needs to be expressed. I've never been interested in, uh, in academic learning for its own sake, I have to say. Uh, but my time at King's had a really uh, undeniable impact on everything that followed. Uh, a bigger impact than I ever imagined, I think, when I first entered King's. I found myself here having left school with no A-levels, um, at 17 years old, with no career aim other than to have a joyous and satisfactory life. Fortunately, I had no family cultural background that pressurised me to do anything other than be a good person, if you could, and be nice to, to your friends and family. 
Um, and I left school and started to train as a draftsman, working for the Greater London Council, which was a thing once, uh, in their public health engineering department. And I had no formal understanding of engineering at all at that stage. Uh, but I really quickly realised that the engineers ruled the roost in the, draft, the, the drawing office I worked in, and that to progress further, the, you needed to be an engineer, and to be an engineer, you needed to get yourself a degree. So when I came to apply to King's, with five O levels at the lowest possible grade that you can have to pass, and, and an ordinary national certificate in engineering. I applied because I wanted to remove an obstacle, if you like, rather than to gain a degree. I realise now it's quite privileged to think like that because if you're trying to get a degree now, it's almost essential. But it was a kind of privilege to be able to say, well, I just need it to get this thing out of the way. I want to dedicate this talk to Prof Kevin Nash, who some here will know, some will have heard of, um, Kevin's really the reason I ever got to King's because um, you might wonder how somebody with five O levels and no A, le a levels and an ONC who didn't know <coughs> what the, that the square root of minus one even existed, never mind how to do it. But it was, you know, I don't have heroes in my life, but Kevin did a heroic thing in taking on somebody like me at the time. Um, and when I was asked to do this, my, one of my first thoughts was of Kevin. Uh, and I went to the Institution of Civil Engineers to look at his obituary, actually. And it, this is what it says about him. Within the university, his aim was to produce thoughtful, sensitive graduates who could see the role of engineering in helping to provide a civilised world and who were sufficiently well-educated to appreciate the contributions of others. I've never read that before you asked me to do this, but when I read it, I realised that um, what he'd done to me, actually, because that's what I became, <laughs> one of Kevin's type of engineers, the kind of engineer that people generally don't think of when they think of engineers. Not because I think I'm special, but because uh, the, I suppose what he'd embedded in me somehow was the idea that engineering was, was a way of doing things not necessarily a pursuit in itself. What I learned from Kevin was that learning wasn't about lecture notes and memorising, but about thinking and trying and failing and acknowledging our failure and adapting to what the failure taught us and all that stuff that actually, as a practice en engineer, is, uh, is impossible to do without. It's the only way you, you progress and cope and that anything ever gets done. When I left King's, with the, uh, having taken four years, I don't know why everybody else took three, but some of us decided that four was a better <laughs> period. With my third class honours degree tucked under my arm, Kevin sent me a letter to say how pleased he was that I'd emerged with a degree in addition to all the other things that I'd been up to while I was there. <laughs> uh, and I kind of thought, this is classic Kevin Nash, which is giving you a little nudge at your shortcomings along with all the encouragement to go on, get out there and, and, and do what you've been, been taught to do. So I'm not going to lecture anybody today, having said that I'm not crazy about lecturing anyway. But what I want to do is share some thoughts that have formed in my head during the 50 years or so as a designer. Talk about the influence of Kings on me and about design, how I think it's helped me to think about sustainability. Um, which I think actually, I don't think engineering can be anything but sustainable if you do it properly. It's, it's inherent in good engineering that it's a sustainable practice. We're not going to talk about the nitty gritty detail of sustainability, so if anybody wants to ask me which energy systems are best, you can do that afterwards to somebody else. We're going to talk about um, more the kind of prospects of sustainability for human species, which is a pretty big task, I think. And we, but we'll have a go at it tonight and at least get some of the thoughts going. I think it's what Kevin would want and it's what he would see as contributing to his civilised world, I think. We'll start with some of my, my three guiding principles. 
which I learned along the route. And I use actually in all aspects of my life, not just as an engineer. Number one, don't be professional. Number two, don't follow the rules and regulations. Number three, stop searching for answers. By not being professional, I mean, I don't mean be unprofessional. I mean, don't become your professional role. Don't aim, aim always to think like an ordinary person first. Don't think like a specialist or a job title. Don't be constrained by your specific training. Always be able to ground your behaviour as a human being in the world. I mean, I regularly hear people say things to me like, well, as a solicitor, I were, or as an architect, I think, or as a... And I say, no, no, I don't know. I'm not paying you for consultancy. What do you think? What do you, the person, think about this? We need our specialist knowledge to produce the outcomes that we make decisions about. But making decisions through a set of specialisations is actually a very poor way to, to design anything. It's a, it's a way to get a, a, a less than optimum result. So we, we, we're only, everything we do, everything we make, every action we take is for us as people. So we should root it in our, in our own human behaviours and our own human needs. So I want to ask us all this evening to just try and think like the person you are, the whole person you are, not just your set of specialist skills. The second of those guidelines was just cast aside the, the constraints of rules and regulations, not because they're not incredibly important, which of course they are, but they are guidelines. They're, they're things we've set up for ourselves to show us where the boundaries are. They're not there to stop us going beyond, outside, looking over, under, tunnelling under, going around. They're there for guidance. And they're there to say that when you go beyond these, you should know why you're going beyond them, what the implications might be, what the hazards and risks are in that. But if you work within those constraints and rules, you actually don't, nothing really progresses. All you're doing is, is reproducing uh, things which are probably suboptimum most of the time. Now, it's odd in a way to say this, because there was a time when, as indigenous peoples, we we always did that. We, we just dealt with the world in its complex whole. Um, we didn't, we created kind of methods and explanations in order to understand how the whole of the world worked and we didn't fuss over finding single ideologies that explained everything to us in detail. We thought, you know, we thought of rainforest as one great complex thing. Um, and we didn't question which parts of the rainforest were the most important, whether it was the trees or the canopy or the mulchy base. We saw it as a whole thing and a whole part of the ecology in which we lived. And we, we accepted, actually, that it could only be understood as a whole and that we gained nothing for the whole by trying to break it into parts. And, in fact, our survival depended on the success of our ability to live as individuals and communities within that whole environment. That was the only way we could successfully survive. That's how we've come to be where we are, are now. We, we, we weren't resistant to the complexity that the world threw at us, uh, but we also didn't try to simplify it. The approach that we took, actually, as we can see, worked pretty well because it's got us through, um, even allowing for war, plague, famine and the like, where our species actually has flourished. And uh, what we're looking at tonight, in a way, is that I think something has changed. And one of the things that's changed is we live lives which are broken down into specialisations a lot of the time. We, we talk about being in arts and science and culture and commerce and all sorts of other categories. And we think, when we think at all, in ideologies and specialisms. And, um, and in the process, we seem to almost be in fear of the complexity, the, the real complexity that makes life rich and worthwhile. I mean, actually, that's what we love about life, is the rich complexity. It's not so much fun if it's broken into bits. And that aim to simplify has not resulted in making life better. It's often resulted in making life complicated. And complicated is different to complex. Complicated is problematic and difficult to negotiate. The world can't be understood in parts, actually. No person is only a scientist or an artist or 
any of those one things. Um, and one of the recurring complaints people raise about living sustainably is that they, they look at all the different elements and, and they find it all t too complicated to navigate. I mean, even the simple thing of, you know, you have a piece of waste in your hand in your home and you're thinking, where does this go? Well, that's because we've actually made things more complicated. And those are all constraints, actually, on living in the most sustainable way we can. What we want to do is find ways to, to live in a complex world. Um, because otherwise, the, the result is often we do nothing. We don't know what to do with that piece of waste, so we, it just goes in the waste bin. It doesn't go in any of the categories that, would, that are designed to try to make life easier. But we have to do something. We can't just uh, give up. And, we, and I think we have to embrace, as a designer, what we always do is you embrace the complexity. You don't shun it or try to make it easy. You look at it as a whole and say, OK, let's take the whole thing and let's see what we can make of it. The final guiding thought is, was about looking for answers. And, you know, outside of exams and quizzes, there's not really any value in answers. They're dead ends, if you think about it. What, a, what an answer does is gets you to a point where you can abandon a particular path because it yields no further questions. And certainly for, for, for designing or as a, for engineering, in many ways, uh, we're not particularly interested in answers. We're, we're interested in finding the questions that will lead us to the, to the brief that we are going to try and eventually resolve. In my final year at King's, I, I took, a, as did others, I took advantage of a course unit system. And um, because you only needed to study three core engineering subjects uh, as a minimum, that's what I did, and filled the rest of my time with all the other courses that I could possibly fit into my program. Uh, one of those was the War and Science course, which I'm, I know others have have been in and come across. And there was a much, at that time particularly, there was, you know, in the mid-1970s, it was a, there was a lot about that course that was weird. Uh, not least of all was the sight of a number of hippies sitting in a room full of uh, military officers in training in tweed jackets with very short haircuts. And as with any course, there's kind of particular elements which somehow engage you as an individual. And for me, it was the... There was an element of it which was a study of the ethics of engineering and science in the context of war and armaments. Uh, something I hadn't really ever thought about before, didn't ever have a need to think about as a kid growing up in the East End of London. It wasn't something we spent much time thinking of. And in that course, I was introduced to the existence of, of J. Robert Oppenheimer. We had to explore Oppenheimer's dilemma in leading the Los Alamos Research Laboratory at the Manhattan Project in developing the atomic bomb. I'd never heard of Oppenheimer, but I have now, and I did then. And I think he has something to tell us about our sustainability. In 1942, when Oppenheimer was appointed to lead the Los Alamos Laboratory, the world faced, you, you could argue, the first occasion in human history when humankind realized, was conscious that if this project was successful, we'd have the ability to annihilate ourselves. Okay, I, I don't think that had existed at any moment before we reached that point. And it's a pretty uh, startling thing to have to deal with. I mean, it's pretty heavy lifting for anyone. And, and fortunately, uh, Oppenheimer had 600,000 helpers throughout the project. And his ethical dilemma, I think, could, you could summarize as... He had to resolve the issues of designing a means of realizing human self-extinction in order to make life better at the time. I mean, it's the ultimate dilemma, if you think about it. Um, if you go to... In, in 1953, he, he gave a series of Leith, Leith lectures for the BBC, six of them, I think, on, on the subjects of science and the common understanding... And he talks about all manner of things, and, and particularly refers to what he calls scientific thinking. It's worth saying, he, if Oppenheimer was a polymath, he, although he was there as a scientist and a kind of manager of the project, 
he was, he was a very culturally rich person, musically and, and in, in all the arts. So we're not dealing with somebody with a narrow view here. And if you haven't either listened to him or... And the transcripts are also available on, on the BBC. They are really... I really commend them to you. I, you, you might want to read them because they are so jam-packed with content that listening to them is a bit mind-blowing at times. The key ethical dilemma for Oppenheimer and the others involved was, I think, that the technical... For the first time, our technological advancement had produced a major socio-cultural problem. So you could argue before that, most of our technology was driven by socio-cultural needs and, and wishes. Suddenly, we'd... And, of course, we've now become used to this, actually. But for, almost for the first time, we had this thing where we had the, this technology that we hadn't adapted to. We didn't... We genuinely had no social adaptation that we could switch to to say this is how to behave. I think we're in a similar position now in our response and, it, and, and unfortunately for us it's in addition to the atomic weapon and that hasn't gone away but we've kind of managed it, we've learned to live, live with it. But we're in a similar position for the second time now where our response to climate change and its impact on our, on our, you know, it has an impact on our whole ways of life. And we don't lack the technical knowledge and the expertise to deal with adapting to climate change and extending our future sustainability, which is who knows. But we haven't actually yet found a collective socio-cultural response to the threats to humanity of our own contribution to climate change that our own advancing technology has brought about. We, we're part of an ecosystem. We can and do have an effect on that system, but we haven't got our heads around either individually or as, as even small communities how we should respond to that. And I think that's, that's the current struggle that I see going on day to day. An important theme in Oppenheimer's lectures is what he refers to as scientific thinking. So the way he talks about that is in terms of complementarity, where he talks about the idea that scientists struggle with, where in order to... Under, if you take an electron, we have two conflicting ways of understanding what an electron is all about. You know, on the one hand, it's a particle, but that doesn't fully explain its behaviour, so we also think of it as a wave, but... If you apply your scientific head to that, you can't have both of those. It's like one of... But, but, but we do that, and that's really what he talks about as complementarity. It's about being able to hold two conflicting ideas at the same time in order to understand the whole. Now, I'd never heard somebody talk about this before in that way, probably because I don't spend a, a lot of my time with scientists... Um, and, it, and you, know, you can think of it the same way about time. For most of our day-to-day -day functioning, we th we th time is a linear thing. But actually, to understand time, the whole of time, we have to realise it's non-linear. And, it's, it's, and you can't put the two of those together and make them work. So that idea of holding those two quite conflicting things together, but proceeding with, with the two of them, not trying to, to, to make one of them work, is at the heart of what Oppenheimer talks about when he talks about his scientific thinking. And interestingly enough, it's what I understand to be right at the heart of that's what design is. So that's what you spend all your time doing as a designer, is you purposely are asking questions which generate all sorts of conflicting requirements of you, I mean, even with the very simple thing of designing this table, there's all sorts of stuff that you require this to do that, that you can't accommodate wholly and individually. You, what you have to do is take the collective conflicting ideas and bring them to, to a re what I always talk about as a resolution. So it's not, that's why it's not about answers. It's about resolving things, not solving things. Um, 
What we could argue that Oppenheimer and his, and his cohorts actually managed the design of the first atomic weapon and the ethical dilemma by resolving that it was both a curse and a saviour. They just accepted that it, that it had to be done and that we'd have to find a way to live with the curse that came with the saviour. Um, he, he deals with it by what he calls scientific thinking. I see it as designing a resolution. So over a number of decades, we've kind of socially adapted to living with the atomic bomb. It, that adaptation continues, actually. We, we've, we've got this additional challenge now. And it's the success of our species that has actually set us this, this challenge because we've become something of a planetary infestation. I don't mean that in an offensive way, but when we talk about infestations, we, we actually are talking about things which make, we are making demands on the natural resources, the air, land, water, that seem to be creating challenges to our own existence on a global scale. And if you were an interplanetary anthropologist, you might look at us and say, oh, this, this guy, this is a problem, this species on this planet here. Not because we're evil or bad, but we're actually too successful at the moment. Uh, and we're, because I th I'm going to argue that we're still trying to socially adapt to our su success and find a way to live with that. Much of our human history has been about survival, actually, and growing. Uh, I probably shouldn't talk about growth, should I, in the tech context of uh, this last week or so. But the challenge for us is to find that way to adapt, I think, to our own technological advancement. To, and we've got an exponentially uh, progressing technology, but we can't gear up uh, human social adaptation exponentially. We don't function like that. In fact, you could argue that because generationally, we, are, we, we have longer generations now. We're, we're living to, into our 80s and 90s, and, and the, the, the easiest way to culturally adapt is to die off, actually, and let the next generation pick it up. So, but it is, it's a challenge we have to take on. I've heard lots of people talk about sustainability. As you can imagine, in my, the industry I work in, it's kind of always there. Uh, and I, you hear it in detailed terms and in broad terms. And almost all of the specialist presentations that I've sat through on it um, have made me deeply depressed and uh, in need of some kind of answer. And I even I can remember asking at the end of one of them, you know, okay, I get everything you've said, but that sounds like a despairing place to leave us. What, what do you want us to do? Um, and actually, the specialists that, that I listened to didn't really know what to do. What, what they were good at was understanding uh, and analysing the problem. But all the things they suggested were, were, were it needed kind of really radical, immediate action. And, you know, we're not like that, human beings. It just never happens. It might happen once in a while, but we're really difficult to mobilise as, as communities or uh, global communities to doing something radical, and probably for good reason, because that kind of behaviour can often end in your own extinction if you're not careful. But I don't accept that as a species, as successful as we have shown ourselves to be, we've suddenly lost our core sense of survival. I can't believe Oppenheimer would have thought that either. I mean, the history of mankind is on a whole story of continuous change and adaptation. If you think Darwin, who's often misquoted and misunderstood, but his conclusion was that it wasn't the fittest nor the strongest species that survived, but it was those most able to adapt. So the adapters are the, are those, are the ones that survived. And in Darwinian terms, we've shown ourselves to be masters at adapting to our environment. You know, we live on all, pretty much every bit of the planet we've found a way of living on, under it, over it, in the extreme heat and cold. I'm not saying that's necessarily clever, but it does show that we have a kind of, there's a basic ability in there. And that adaptation actually hasn't been by accident. It's, it's been through design, right? We design our adaptation. 
We all design. Everything we make and do requires us. Even if you say to yourself, I'm not a designer. Yes, you are. Everything. How, do you, how you got here tonight, you designed. Your route here, the, the time you left. Everything we make and do is actually designed. It's thought, I mean, some of it's designed very badly, but, but it all requires you to, to follow a process. And when you do it well, actually, what you find is that it's, it's an unburdening act, design. It liberates you. It doesn't, it's not, because it's not trying to solve things, what it's trying to do is resolve these conflicting issues. Immediately you, d you carry out the process, you are freed to get on with the next thing you're trying to do or to progress the thing you're trying to do. And it does that through questions, not answers. So how do we approach what we might call conscious adaptation. Um, I mean, I think you won't be surprised to hear me say, I think that we do that by design, but what I call design by stealth as well. So it's no good. One of the things I discovered is that finding out how to do something or coming up with a kind of resolution that works for the, th the particular thing you're designing, whether it's a street or a building or maybe a piece of transport infrastructure or some heavy civil engineering, the, there's always a need for you. It's not about just knowing how you do it. You actually have to bring it about within a society. So it's no good me knowing how to make something if I don't know how to convince you we should have one and that we should invest some public funds in it. Or That's often forgotten. I'm not blaming universities for this, but nobody ever told me that at <laughs> university that when you try and do things in the real world, you've got to deal with everybody in that world and you need to be thinking about them, not you. And I can remember, I mean, when I started working on building structures in the 1980s, the key problem was, so I was based in London, the key problem was we developers were uh, wanting to demolish lots of, well, they were demolishing lots of listed and historic buildings. Uh, the planners were, were hating the fact they were doing it. Conservationists were, were in tears at the idea of it. And everybody was kind of loggerheads over it. And the result, result was we got a lot of unnecessary demolition. We got a lot of loss of historic fabric. And even when we retained some of those buildings, we got kind of non-viable either intellectually or financially or both non-viable um, remnants of buildings. The heritage lobby raged against the developers and they met with an equal and opposite resistance. You know, it's the first lesson they taught us in structures is, is things get an equal and opposite resistance. And the practice I was in a partner in at the time stepped back from the argument, actually, and we asked ourselves, how can we resolve the challenge of we live in a, in a country, but certainly in London, you know, it's absolutely jam-packed full of existing buildings, many of them really precious, but you could argue all of them are precious, particularly in the context of climate change. How do we balance keeping those existing buildings, but also adapting, because we have new demands, we have new uses, we have new standards for, all, for what we require to, to live in. And the outcome at that time was that we, we actually did the work in-house, used our engineering knowledge and developed an approach where we could keep existing and historic buildings and adapt them for continued use. And we, and we, we uh, invention sounds like the wrong word, but it didn't exist before. We've, we, we set up the ways that the SPAB, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, used for guiding people how to work with listed buildings, about adding structure in rather than taking stuff away, making anything you, any alterations you do very clear and obvious so that at a later date they could be removed or there's a, there's a kind of, you articulate the work you've done clearly um, because that allows for somebody to do something later or undo what you're doing and, and reuse it. So rather than join in the side of the argument on one side or the other, we kind of just said, well, we want both. We want historic buildings, but we also want a nice, warm, well-insulated office or house. We took that and those two things, and we were answered off. And if you look over throughout London in those days, we, you know, we did a, 
all that work in Shad Thames and in, in Bermondsey, lots of the kind of humble terraces of Hackney and Islington, we took those buildings that, um, with housing associations and we took really damp, crumbly, crummy old buildings and kept virtually all of them but made them livable in um, and did that through not some absolutist extreme argument of either this is good enough or it isn't, but to say, okay, let's do what we can and let's, uh, let's accept both of these things are desirable to us. I mean, what it also means is that you don't expend and dissipate energy on absolutist arguments. You funnel the energy into kind of collaborative development. So I, when I look back on it, I see that it's what we talk about now as sustainability, but it wasn't really a headline term then. Again, in the kind of late 1980s and 1990s, there was common concern about built environment designers, that our streets were becoming hostile and dangerous places. They were, we were designing really beautiful buildings or just very good buildings, but the street quality was poor. And, you know, I can remember lunchtime discussions of us all moaning about it. And it's all the highways engineers' fault. And, and then I went home one night and suddenly thought, you are an engineer, why are you moaning about it? You should do something. So the first thing I thought was, oh, I'll enrol on a highway engineering course. And then I thought, well, actually, it's the people being taught on these courses that are making these streets, so perhaps I shouldn't do that. So what I did was we sat down and just asked ourselves, what are streets for? Now, if you ask that question, it's a horrible answer, because they're for so many things, even simple streets are. And I, streets, I mean the things which have buildings on them. The ones without buildings are roads, but I'm talking about streets where there's multiple uses, whether it's just a simple residential street or the kind of complex streets you get around areas like this. If you try and, if you actually sit and look at this street and think, what are all the things it has to do for all of us, you'll find not only does it have to do lots of things just for you, <laughs> but, it, but it has this, has to do this for all sorts of other uh, people and in all sorts of other ways. So, to f the, the very concept of having a single standardised approach to highways engineering is fundamentally flawed, if you think about it in that way. Now, you can imagine that argument doesn't go down very well if you walk into the local authorities' office. And I won't give it, there's a whole kind of lecture about this, but finding the uh, what the real questions to streets was about was actually that turned out to be the easy bit. The really difficult bit was go, getting somebody to let you do it, was getting somebody to allow you to go and play with their street and change their street into a much better place. Um, and I can honestly, for 10 years, I think, in that way you do when you're much younger, you kind of uh, batter away at people as though they are don't know what they're talking about, and you do. Um, and of course, that gets nowhere. Changing people's minds, it turns out, um, contrary to what our Victorian forefathers would think, is much more difficult than, change it, than, <laughs> than it is to change someone's behaviour and then let them change their own mind. And we, it, it was kind of almost overnight, we suddenly thought, oh, hang on a minute, if we can just get one of these made, people will have to use it in a different way. And the moment they do that, they w their heads will come with them. I remember, you know, as, a, as an East End kid, when I heard about, when I went to university and met all these um, people who were nothing like anybody I grew up with, and they were talking about going on skiing holidays, and I absolutely hated the whole idea of skiing. I thought, what a dreadful thing that is, full of horrible people. Uh, and I refused to do it till I was about 42. Then I went skiing, and it's a fabulous thing to do, it turns out. Uh, and all the people changed uh, into people that were pleasant. But it, the point was, if we can change what people do, they'll bring their minds with them. They'll, 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 they'll do the work for you. So I had to think, how do you do that with street design? How do you do it with red design? And I realised that going into the talking to local councillors and local engineers and planners and saying, you know, what you're doing there, that's not right, do it this way, that doesn't work. So I sat and thought, what are they most interested in? And I came up with three things. And when you do it, it's really simple. 
What's the local councillor most interested in? They want their streets to be safe, they want their streets to be economically viable and, and, and doing well, and they want them to be environmentally good. So we completely changed overnight and went in and said, we've got a way to reduce, fundamentally reduce the hazard on your, that street there. We can make the, the economies of your businesses on that street improve pretty much overnight once we've done it. And the environment, we can measure it and show you that it's in, environment better. And suddenly the world changed. I'm not saying it became easy after that, but we, we, went, from, we went from an argument of, of no to an argument of how. We went straight to that point of instead of trying to batter through, no, 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 we got to, okay, but well, how do we do that? That's still a tough discussion, but at least you're, you're now having a collaborative discussion about how to do something. And what we were doing, actually, was just thinking like ordinary people. We didn't start with the rules. We weren't interested in absolutist solutions. Streets are complex. We maintain the complexity and also make them more usable. And then in the design of sustainable new buildings, we, there are, we come across these very valuable, but actually, in some ways, ideological arguments to conform to, to the kind of extreme standards like Passive House, CQL, Codes for Sustainable Homes, BRIAM. Okay, so these are really incredibly valuable working, guiding things. But they're not how you design a building. They're, about, they're, they're your guidelines about. And, and the problem that we find in our industry sometimes is, first of all, if you try to do them uh, to their extreme, you end up either not being able to afford to or it's too hard and you don't do it. Or you can get the thing which a lot of developers do where they manage to somehow comply with the regulations and tick the boxes and still produce poor quality buildings but ones that, <laughs> that tick a box. Um, now, you know, the, they're there to find our way through the guidelines and to apply it. They're for us to intelligently apply to whatever it is we're doing. You said all the things I'm doing. Actually, if you ask what I am at the moment, I'm a builder. It's what I spend 80% uh, of my time doing uh, for the last year or so and, and will do for another year. I'm building a, ho a home for myself and my family on a brownfield site in Birmingham in the Jewelry Quarter. And the aim of that is to make a home, okay? A low energy, low maintenance home from mostly sustainable materials using mostly local suppliers it's not desirable, nor is it necessary, for a home to score points on an absolutist standard scale. It's, it's valuable to use those scales to guide what you're trying to do. But you won't necessarily have a better home just because you hit passive health. You know, if your family is wretched, it's, your, your passive health home won't make it better. It will just seal them in a box. Um, and I often say to people, you know, given the choice, most people would rather live in a kind of 70% functional house that's full of joy than a 100% than a functional house that's completely joyless. And it's, it's, it's worth remembering that. Right? They're, they're not buildings, they're homes for us, whether they're offices or universities or other institutions or our homes. And we're not trying to demand perfect standards and actually the most sustainable buildings are, are, are buildings which have an, uh, an indefinite life expectancy. And, you know, that there's a, if you want an example, <coughs> Stonehenge doesn't comply with any of those standards, okay? It was made from stone, brought from somewhere else. It's a completely non-renewable material. Nobody knows what it's for. Uh, and it's in a place where everyone wishes it was somewhere else because we can't get to it or round it or under it or over it. But, listen, it's there because we keep things we love. Um, and we can intellectualise them and we can write, uh, you know, his history theses on them, but essentially we've decided we like it. The point is that it's... Well, you need to think about, when you're thinking about sustainability, you've got to think about the long-term, indefinite life of things. If you can make something which has a much longer life, then you already are way up the scoring 
It's a problem that a lot of developers get into when they're designing buildings, which is that they're ticking boxes, but they might be making buildings which we will demolish in 30 years' time. And that's pointless, actually. Better to have an 80% qualifying building that we keep for, forever. The most sustainable house may not comprise a single element that's best in its class, if you think about it, um, because we're interested in it, the whole thing. So what we have to do is, is design sustainable homes by accepting it's the whole design that's critical, and, that, and, and that's about where the building is, which way, for all of those complex things. It's not about the, the sort of individual materials that we use. It's, it isn't just the sum of a load of exemplary parts. And the problem is the environmental discussion in public and social media is in large part binary and unhelpful, actually. It's, you know, we have environmental absolutists making extreme absolute demands, and that generates a massive equal opposite absolute resistance of climate deniers. And, but, you know, one size can't fit all. We, we live in communities with huge inequalities. Um, so you're delusional if you are trying to even approach that by making one size fit all, because that, it just doesn't. Energy needs are personal, actually, as well as general and community-wide, and they are specific to different parts of the planet we occupy. So you can't come up with a fixed. And food need is similarly specific, and it's actually enriched by cultural and climatic differences. It seems highly unlikely we'll ever persuade all humans to adopt a single diet that's considered to be the most sustainable. Uh, and for one thing, we don't even agree on what the diet might be. There's also resistance to continuing technological research, especially where that research is energy and resource consuming. But then the, it's that research that results in the development of renewable energy resources and alternative sustainable food production. And if we stop that research even several decades earlier, we might never have efficient solar and wind farming, for instance. I mean, it's the classic kind of Oppenheimer dilemma. We've got to do a thing, but we don't want, you know. And the thing to do is to be, you have to be grown up about that, I think. So, I mean, I've spent my entire career as a designer and at times a maker of things. And my experience tells me we only adapt through the approach that is designed. You know, we can't choose to evolve gills to offset rising water levels uh, or get thicker fur to protect us from extreme temperatures. We can't consciously do that. Well, if you can, good luck. But we, we consciously evolve our behaviours all the time, actually. Um, and we're really good at it. Uh, and I think that is the route that we, will, we are taking and we will have to continue to, to take. And it means starting with the acceptance that complementarity is at the heart of the way that we do that, the way that we design. And I want to be clear that, that by complementarity, I don't mean compromise. So I don't want to hear the word compromise in a design studio. Compromise is what you do if you can't design. Okay? Compromise is where... It's part of the problem, actually. When you compromise, you resolve nothing other than you're going to disagree. And it's an unstable state, actually, a, a compromise, because the moment something goes wrong, you're back where you started. You haven't gone anywhere. You, to, to move things forward, you need a stable kind of state. And design is about resolution. When you resolve something together, when we don't agree to disagree, we, we sit and talk about what you really want and you really want, and we find a way to go forward with which resolves, or it doesn't, might not satisfy any one of them, but what it might do is satisfy that collective. That's really stable, because when something goes wrong, we all join in to kind of fix it, because it's in our interest, actually, to keep that stability. Whereas a compromise is always only in any one person's interest, whoever can tilt the, the balance their way. So design allows that conflict to remain. And if you look at the other side of it, our historic attempts at absolutism have, have been seen to require a level of control and oppression that as creatures, actually, we just have found to be intolerable. We've, in the whole of human history, we've never learned how to tolerate absolutist conditions of uh, social and cultural conditions. 
you know, there's pressures in our news media and social media now to adopt positions, actually. We're, you know, we're, we, we pressurise each other, identifying ourselves as environmentalists and climate change deniers. But the, these positions don't... We all know this. They don't lead anywhere. There aren't any absolute answers, and there's no perfect solutions either. There's a lot of imperfect changes we can make, and, and we are making, actually, every day. And, and I think we'll continue to make a difference. And I'm not arguing a kind of vanilla type, oh, it'll be all right, don't worry, everybody, go home, it's fine. My experience is that change is only done by design, and that, that means you're actively doing something, and it, and it isn't just about actively working out what's a good resolution, a good way to forward it. You've also got to work out how you're going to do that. What's the most effective way to do that in a way that is going to be accepted, that others are going to be able to adapt to? And I, that's why I talk about doing it with stealth and not by feeding conflict. I mean, I'm confident in our ability to design our way to adapting these changes that, I mean, inevitably face any creature living on a live, dynamic planet. And we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. We're not some kind of evil. We are, we're one of the creatures trying to balance uh, our life within an ecosystem. In Oppenheimer's talks, either at the beginning of the first one or at the beginning of one of them, I don't recall, but he, in the, if you, and if you've ever heard him talk, it's a kind of very flat, laconic drawl. He brings us kind of starkly to earth at the beginning with a reminder of our, the ultimate human condition. He says, the day will come when our race is gone. This house, this earth, in which we live will one day be unfit for human habitation as the sun ages and alters. And it's a kind of sombre, realistic comment that we, it's, it's one of those conflicting things we have to balance, I think, first of all, to understand that. And, but he, he adds, and, and that's kind of what all he talks about all the time is, and yet no man thinks wholly in these terms. In other words, yes, we know it will come to an end, but we can't go on by just thinking that. We have to get on with, with the living of it. So in, we already hold these two conflicting ideas simultaneously, actually, all of us. Uh, we do it from day to day in different ways. It's sometimes much tougher than other times, and for some people it's much tougher than others. But even if we don't linger on them every moment of the day, they're there. Our job, I think, is to hold that thought of our eventual extinction alongside the enthusiasm and confidence to pursue the best paths to our survival. That's our job, is to see how well we can not just survive, because we want to flourish and live well within the system we're in. The route to the Earth becoming unfit for human habitation is one of constant change, of course, in whether or not the final days are catastrophic. And on that route, we would do well, I think, to avoid binary and argumentative processes, avoid seeking single absolutist solutions, and pursue these questions, and, uh, which avoid that energy-draining search for answers. We can most usefully put our energy into designing all the multiple ways that will help us to adapt, except that none of these ways are perfect, but all of them will contribute. Thank you for listening. Martin, thank you. That was fantastic. Taking us through from Darwin to Oppenheimer to building close to here at Chad Thames and to the streets of today. You certainly made us think and raised quite a few issues for us to think about. And I certainly agree with you. I don't think one, uh, suit, one fits all. One case fits everything. Um, I know we're close to time, but I don't know if there are any key, one or two perhaps key points or questions that anybody would like to raise or open up any discussion. I know we got some questions uh, from the people who have joined us on Zoom, but I think in many ways you covered and raised some of the answers to some of the questions that were raised. Well, I've told you I don't have any answers, so, you could, <laughs> so that's easy. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that Oppenheim fascinated me, 
um, particularly the dilemma, as you say, that he was under, and in some ways the work that was done afterwards as part of the Pugwash conferences. I don't know if anybody's familiar here, but um, somebody who became that was not originally British, but was British and worked here, uh, Rotblatt, Joseph Rotblatt, was one of the key people who was at the very first uh, Pugwash conference in 57, so a few years after this uh, Oppenheim's talks you yeah. spoke about, um, and went on to uh, Joseph Rotblatt, together with the Pugwash conferences, won the Nobel Prize for Peace. In quote, if you like, considering the issues of how to safely use the outcome res work from the atomic bomb and nuclear materials. So uh, there's that sort of, if you like, almost goes on and closes, mm. not doesn't close it, but it raises some more of the issues. But, uh, well, if there are no specific questions, I'm sure there will be some and we can have them. I'd like to, again, thank everybody who's joined us, particularly those people who have joined us on Zoom, and remind everybody, please do try and join us in person for the AGM and lunch on November the 19th. Those of you who are here physically, please join us for a drinks reception upstairs. Agnes and others will show you the way up there. And those of you who've joined on Zoom, I hope you'll have your own drinks at home. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank and again, you. Martin, thank you. Thank you very much. Is that okay? That was wonderful. Good. Thank you.